Hi everyone. First of all, if you're one of my regular YouTube viewers, uh, this video is actually aimed at my students at Parkland College, so you may want to go ahead and stop the video right now. I'm aiming to give them an anatomy lesson on all the lathes that we have in the shop. So one thing you'll notice about this lathe is that we have it set up for using 5C collets instead of having a chuck on it. The way the collet system works is the collet has threads on the back here, there's a draw tube that the collet threads into, and there's a nose in the spindle of the machine that matches the taper on the collet here. So when you tighten up the draw tube, it pulls the collet into the nose and tightens it on the part. Changing speeds on this machine is quite easy. It's these three levers here. You have A, B, C, D, and F, G. Not really sure why they skipped over E. So there's also a speed chart here, and there are two speed ranges on this machine. Both of them actually have a pretty comprehensive range from low to high. So we generally keep this on the high speed range, going from 85 to 2,000. Uh, changing belt positions on that is a bit of a pain. You have to take this entire cover off of the machine. So we generally don't change it at all. But again, it's a very comprehensive range going from 85 to 2,000. So if you wanted to be at 85 RPM for maybe a threading job, you would change this handle to B. And you usually have to move the chuck in order to do that. This lever would have to be on C, which it already is, and this lever would have to be on G. If you wanted to go to 2000 RPM, this lever would have to be at A, this one would be at D, and that one would be at F. Changing feed rates is also quite simple on this machine. You have a feed reverse lever, which you would only use if you were cutting left-handed threads or knurling. And then you have these two levers right here, RST and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So your two feed charts that you're going to be using most are going to be right here and right here. This one is feed rate for the power feed and you can go anywhere from 1,000th per revolution to 32,000th per revolution. You have to change some gearing to get in between those. So we generally keep it here where it's usable, and it goes from 1,000th to 8,000th. Uh, so for 1,000th, you would have this at R, and again, you generally have to move the chuck, and then you would have this lever at 5, which is way down here. That works just like a stick shift in a car. If you wanted eight thousandths per revolution, you would be at T2. So again, generally you have to move the chuck in order to get this to mesh. And it's not cooperating on me here. But you get the idea, you would move that to T, move that up to two. So I'm just gonna put that at S, which is four thousandths per revolution. Your threads per inch chart is read the same way. In the gear setting that we have here, we can go from 14 threads per inch to 80 threads per inch. If you needed to do something coarser, you would actually have to change the gears to what's shown in the diagram here. So here's a close-up shot of our feed rate chart. And these are the gears that are actually set up for it right here. You have a 21 tooth, a 100 tooth, a 60 tooth, and behind the 100 is a 120. You can see this bracket here pointing to which feed rates are produced by which levers. If you needed coarser feed rates or coarser threads, you would have to change to this gearing setup, a 42 tooth gear, a 120 gear, and a 36 tooth gear. All of those are behind this cover. You should also note that this diagram right here shows the relationship between the longitudinal feed and the cross feed. So in this case, all of these feed rates are for longitudinal feed, and the cross feed is one quarter of the longitudinal feed. So if you had it set at T2, that would be eight thousandths per revolution longitudinal, but only two thousandths per revolution cross feed. So here's a close up of our threading chart, and it's read the exact same way. You've got 
the lever positions here. In bold, you have the threads per inch. And then these are the gears that are set up in the machine. And currently, this is what's set up. Uh, if you needed coarser gears, you would have to change to this setup. And then you've got some special threads that you may have to cut, for instance, 13. If you needed to cut a half 13 thread, you would actually have to have this gearing set up. And in this case, it's 42, 120, and then this one's labeled X. So for a 13 tooth gear, that X gear would have to be a 39 tooth gear. If you wanted to cut 23, it would have to be a 69 tooth gear. This lathe is also set up so you can cut metric threads, but in order to do so, you'll have to put some extra gears in there. And this is read the same way as our threading chart. Uh, in this case, the back gear is 127, the front one is 120, and then these two are variable. So if you wanted to cut a uh, 0.5 millimeter pitch, the V up there at the top would have to be 35, and the W down here at the bottom would have to be 60. And that's how that chart is read. So here are our carriage controls. Uh, you have the same controls as any other lathe, longitudinal, crossfeed, and compound. One quirky thing about this particular machine is that the longitudinal handle is on the opposite side that it usually is. Normally it's over here, and this is a British machine. I've spoken with some British machinists, and they're of the opinion that this keeps the hand away from hot chips, but I can tell you in my personal experience that that is not true. The power switch for this machine is this maroon handle right here. You have to pull it out of the detent and then up for forward. And then down for reverse. To engage the power feed on this machine in both the longitudinal and cross feed direction, it's this handle right here. It will engage upwards and then you kick it out in order to disengage it. It determines whether it's in longitudinal or cross feed with this plunger right here. If it's pushed in all the way as it is right there, then you should be in longitudinal feed. If the plunger is pulled out, you should be in cross feed. All of your threading controls are on the left hand side of the carriage. So these are your half nuts. This is your threading dial and what points to the number right here. You can see your lead screw back here and there's this collar that actually engages it with the gear train. So if you want to be threading you have to have this collar slid in. Um, if not, you can slide it out and it'll save on a little bit of wear on the lead screw bearings. This is the lathe's foot brake. You can actually use this to shut the machine off just by stomping on it and it will turn off the power switch. And then you also use it with the collet set up because you would want to make sure the spindle won't spin while you're tightening the collets. The tailstock controls on this machine are pretty much the same as most other lathes. You have a cam lock to lock the tailstock from sliding. You have a quill lock just like the other lathes in the shop. You would use that to keep the quill from backing off if you are supporting a piece with the live center. If you're not supporting a piece with the live center, you would have that loose so that you're free to drill. There is a dial on the tailstock handle. It reads in thousandths of an inch and it's 100 thousandths per revolution. Oddly enough, you can't re-zero this dial. It doesn't move at all. So if you were doing any kind of precision drilling, for instance, from your touch-off point or from the full diameter of the drill, you would maybe put a little Sharpie mark there at whichever mark was your, your zero, and then uh, you would count from that mark. All of the lathes in the shop have some sort of electrical shutoff on the back side of the machine. And most of them look similar to this with a yellow and red lockout tagout. This one actually says on and off. And in this case, 
there's an opening here where you could put a padlock in there so that if you needed to work on the machine, for instance, changing gears, you could put your padlock through there and change the gears without someone coming up and turning on the machine while your hands are inside it. Quite often, someone will come up to me and say that their machine is not working, and a lot of times it's just because someone has turned off the electrical shutoff on the back for some reason.